I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the first interview uh, as part of our lecture series for the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Uh, we call these the Institute Encounters. And uh, today our guest is Dr. Caroline Wintera, who is the Anthony P. Meaner Family Professor of the Humanities at Stanford University, the director of the Stanford University Humanities Center, uh, and also a professor of history, and by courtesy, a professor of classics. Um, so, covers a great deal of ground. Um, she researches and uh, writes on the intellectual history of America, and particularly the history of the American Enlightenment uh, and classical studies in America. Um, she is on the verge uh, of uh, coming forth with a new book called The American Enlightenment, is, which is what I'd like to talk to you about today. So maybe you can give us a sense of what the American Enlightenment is and why the Enlightenment is, is fairly well-trodden ground in terms of scholarly research, uh, why it's important now to distinguish the American Enlightenment from the Enlightenment as a more general Western phenomenon. So, yeah, we can have two definitions of the American Enlightenment. One is the actual events of the 18th century in which there were a number of educated people around the Atlantic who began to imagine that they were living in a new kind of era, a new era of human progress in which the future would be better than the past and in which human reason rather than faith or superstition or religious revelation would yield empirical new answers to an array of questions, either about the natural world, scientific revolution, about the social world, how to organize your society, or about the political world, how to create uh, new states and new forms of governance that were better adapted to human nature. So that was the 18th century project of enlightenment. But the Enlightenment didn't have that name in the 18th century. So the idea that there was an era called the Enlightenment did not emerge until the 20th century, when there were a series of political revolutions, the Russian Revolution, um, the Cold War, a series of very dramatic political events that allowed or encouraged historians to begin to look back into the 18th century for the antecedents of the very tumultuous events of the 20th century. So in some ways we can say that the 20th century invented the era of the Enlightenment for a variety of modern political purposes. And, and it saw itself as its culmination. The people who invented the Enlightenment then wanted to see themselves as completing the work. Well, this is, this is the debate, right? Mm -hmm. People only do things when there's interesting intellectual terrain. Mm -hmm. So an intellectual terrain that is interesting is one that we don't agree about. So that's a big question. Are we the heirs of the 18th century? Or um, have we moved in a, in a very different direction from the 18th century? And some of the great works of the Enlight on the Enlightenment that were published in the 20th century have successively weighed in on this question. Also the question of whether the Enlightenment was ultimately a positive development or whether it led to everything that was wrong with the 20th century. So um, some thinkers in the 1940s um, with the rise of totalitarian regimes began to say well, perhaps the Enlightenment, with its emphasis on rationalism, was the origin of modern totalitarianism. So suddenly the Enlightenment becomes an urgent question um, in a way that it may not have been before. It was merely latent. Um, now it's an active question. Now on the American side, the idea that there was a particular version of the Enlightenment called the American Enlightenment emerged in the wake of World War II. It was a post-World War II phenomenon in which a number of American historians, American political theorists, began to ask questions about the post-World War II world settlement in which a bipolar world was emerging, 
um, in which it seemed that the world had been divided into two radically opposed camps, the Soviet Union on the one hand, the Americans on the other. What did the Enlightenment have to say about that? And suddenly they were finding this new thing called the American Enlightenment in the 18th century, and particularly in the founding era. Um, and they began to publish a series of works over the late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, um, that look very, very closely, especially at the political figures of the late 18th century. Was this connected to notions of American exceptionalism? Yeah, yeah, and definitely. So? It was connected to notions of American exceptionalism because it was put forth very commonly as a thesis, both by Americans and by European scholars like uh, Peter Gay in his uh, very well-received two books on the Enlightenment, that the U.S. was the culmination of the European Enlightenment. So there had been a lot of um, theor theorizing about various things in Europe, um, theorizing about politics, theorizing about society, but it was in the American Revolution that these theories were embodied in um, something that was practical. So this, of course, was feeding into ideas that Americans were practical. There was the frontier spirit, it was Davy Crockett, you know, all of these cultural presumptions about Americans as being non-theoretical, as being practical, were enacted in the idea that especially the key document of the U.S. Constitution was the embodiment of many, many strands of enlightenment that were coming together, and that it took people like Ben Franklin who was actually not very involved in the making of the U.S. Constitution, but he was very practical. Um, it took people like that um, to, to sort of collect all these European theories and then pull out this remarkable document. Um, and so whatever then was happening in Europe during the 1940s and 50s, um, that was appalling um, when viewed from across the Atlantic, Americans could comfort themselves that their enlightenment would not lead to totalitarianism. Their enlightenment was going to lead to the institutions of freedom that the 1950s seemed to be bringing to was fruition. That it was an enlightenment in a kind of pure form. Uh, you had a virgin territory, a virgin society, you had the opportunity to design something from scratch, and hence the various strands of Enlightenment thinking could now be put to their full realization and test. Yeah. Because that was sort of the notion that they were Yeah. Mentioning. So they, they didn't see, uh, as kind of distinct from the view that, that America was in some way uh, part of the uh, British world and was inheriting a set of institutions and conventions that are, were peculiarly British. Sounds like a different view of America than, than that, which might have been more Burkean. Well, you know, the, the, these, are, these are great questions, and, and I, I, I don't think that any historian is fully capable of neatening the intellectual field, right? There's always sloppiness that's, mm -hmm. that's built in, especially with, with intellectual matters, right? Ideas are very, very messy and open and fluid. But there were a couple things that made Americans in the 40s and 50s and 60s believed that their enlightenment was particularly um, innocent of, mm -hmm. of you know, future totalitarian tendencies. One was the widely propagated assumption that the American Enlightenment was not anti-clerical and anti-church in the way that especially the French Enlightenment was seen to be. Um, American ministers weighed in frequently mm -hmm. and at length about um, the, the process of Enlightenment. Um, and if you know, if anything, American churches emerged in better health after the American Revolution than before. The number of people attending church increased over the course of the 19th century. So there was this sense, and this, this really comes out in probably the most famous book about the American Enlightenment, Henry May's The Enlightenment in America, which was published in 1977. He was a professor of history at Berkeley. Um, and he said that the distinguishing feature of the American Enlightenment is that it was a religious enlightenment. And this, of course, comes out of the concern that one thing you could say about you know, the Soviets is that they were godless communists, but Americans would never go in that direction because their enlightenment was thoroughly religious um, in every endeavor, science, in politics, 
you know, there was a minister, John Witherspoon, the president of Princeton, who was a who was a signer. So, so this kind of uh, wrapped the American Enlightenment in a in a quilt of religiosity that that the French Enlightenment seemed very much to lack. There was also the sense that. America was a virgin land, that there was no ancien regime to overthrow. So, so the post-colonial moment in the United States did not require the kind of violence and, and overthrowing of, of old encrusted traditions. The class consciousness that would go with that. Uh, yeah. Sort of Louis Arts's thesis. Right, yeah. right, absolutely. And in, you know, in the way that even the Mexican Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, to take an, another new world context, the Mexican Revolution required the, the active, violent throwing off of an ancien regime in the same way that the French Revolution did, although that was not a, a post-colonial um, movement. So, so there were a number of um, features of the North American situation that 20th century historians pulled out and um, added significance to in order to make the claim. Somewhat contradictory features though. On the one hand, sort of the virgin land, uh, we can start from scratch. On the other hand, uh, we are Christians and we build Christianity, unlike those more radical Europeans, we build Christianity into our enlightenment. So uh, having it both ways. Having it, having it both ways, yeah. Um, and this is of course what gives us terrain to, mm -hmm. to fight about. Um, you know, another feature of the American enlightenment um, that Europeanists did not have to deal with was the pressure of slavery um, in the New World context. Um, by 1780, there were roughly 900,000 slaves in the United States. And this was something, this was a, you know, a fact at the time, but it was something that historians of the 20th century, historians of the American context, had to pay a lot of attention to. And I think the most significant to work to come out of that concern was David Bryan Davis's uh, two-volume um, manifesto about this, the problem of slavery in Western culture, the problem of slavery in the American Revolution. What was it about the American context that was in the time that we call the Enlightenment, making slavery a problem in a new way. Of course, this is coming out of the Civil Rights Movement, when suddenly the racial pressures in the United States are putting pressures on the historical profession to come up with answers and genealogies. Um, and Davis's book and a number of other very significant books, um, like Winthrop Jordan's White Over Black, uh, come out of this very, very, um, difficult modern moment. So the American Enlightenment as seen from the perspective of America's self-definition in the 20th century mm -hmm. is, um, is, is unique in the sense that it has to directly confront slavery and race, I suppose, as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. in, in a way that's peripheral mm -hmm. to the Enlightenment in, in Europe. So it's really a rather complicated picture. I mean, there's there's no kind of clear-cut model. Uh, people are sort of patching together a number of notions. Uh, what what then do you think <laughs> is distinctive about the American Enlightenment? You know, I, I've asked myself that question a lot so that I refrain from, you know, putting scare quotes around all three parts of the title. You know, mm -hmm. was there just one American Enlightenment? Was it American? And was it an Enlightenment? So how do we think about these questions? So the first thing I would say is that um, I don't think there's anything exceptional about America or the American Enlightenment. What I do think is that there are things that are particular or particularly strongly developed mm -hmm. in the North American context. Just to take one example, this is a colonial context. Um, for 180 years before the American Revolution, there are a lot of institutions of intellectual life that are extremely undeveloped in the colonial context, even less developed than in the Spanish mm -hmm. New World. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, for example, no royal courts in the New World. Um, there's not even an aristocracy in the new in the British imperial North American context. So what does that mean? Well, royal courts are some, you know, regardless of what you know, radicals of the Enlightenment would tell us, royal courts are some of the greatest mm -hmm. 
um, cradles of intellectual life. Kings and queens patronize the arts and sciences. So none of this can work in, in the New World context. Americans... How does this happen in, uh, in the Spanish colonies? Well, in the Spanish colonies, um, you have vice regents that are in place in, in the New World and, and great urban centers. So you have much, much larger cities in the Spanish New World. Uh, not as big as before the Spaniards got there, but, mm -hmm. but Mexico City is, is really the largest city in the New World by a long shot. It's got Mexico City you know, around this around the 18th century, I believe, has a population of about a million. Mm -hmm. The largest city in British America at that time is Philadelphia. Thirty thousand people. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, you know, fifty, sixty thousand. A large university mm -hmm. like Berkeley mm -hmm. is is it. So now to say that Mexico City has a population of a million is is to overlook some of the you know features of, of you know. The, Indian population that lives there, etc. But there's room for institutional infrastructure there, um, and connections with the royal courts um, in Spain, in Italy, that are not developed in the North American context. So there's there's deurbanization, there's um, demonarchization. Americans who are interested um, in seeing royal courts in action have to get on a ship and to go. It's very, very difficult for publications, for example, the Royal Society, um, which is the chief uh, kind of scientific and literary arm of, of England in the, in the late 17th and 18th centuries. It's difficult for those publications to cross the Atlantic. It's difficult to, to um, uh, disperse those those publications in the new world. So we have to remember that this colonial context is preventing the growth of some of the institutions that really help the Enlightenment to flourish in Europe, like the Salon in, in Paris. Um, these things are a marvel to the Americans who get on ships, like Ben Franklin, John Adams, they see, oh my gosh, look what's happening in Paris. We, we wish we could do this at home. And in fact, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences is founded in 1780 by John Adams when he comes back from France. And it's explicitly modeled essentially on the kinds of intellectual activities that are only possible in a royal context, you know, and this is after the American Revolution. So it's one of the things I am interested in tracing in this book is actually in the midst of Republican Revolution, how many vestiges of monarchical and aristocratic culture remain within the United States, even though Americans choose not to look um, in that direction because the ideology of, of anti-monarchism and, and kingless republicanism requires them to ignore um, those features. But they also think they have to catch up. And they, they feel they're up. behind, so they want to kind of bring in some of the kind of intellectual apparatus, or, or more than that, the kind of... Uh, networks, funding, I, there's no, no sense of royal endowment, you don't have the kind of people who can uh, lavishly endow this kind of activity in the United States. It's right, well, well of oddly enough, amateur that, basis, so. well, you know, um, right, so so one of the great uh, royal patrons of the middle of the 18th century, oddly enough, uh, is George II, um, mm -hmm. who reigns longer than any of the other Hanoverian monarchs, but of course we always focus on George III, because he was, you know, the guy who lost the the American colonies. But George II um, gives a lot of money to Princeton. Um, and uh, the, through sort of through um, this this person named uh, Jonathan Belcher, who's a, a, a royal governor, um, and he also helps to found the University of Göttingen in, in mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. So I think of this as as the Hanoverian <laughs> Enlightenment. But we tend to write out royal. Um, uh, achievements as as mm -hmm. part of the American mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. but I think that we need to reclaim the importance of aristocratic and royal patronage networks when we think about the American Enlightenment, even though they were truncated by comparison to mm -hmm. what was available mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, so that's one of the the features that I would say makes North America particular but certainly not exceptional, because there are other imperial peripheries that one would need to look at. You know, what's happening with the Jesuits in Asia? Scotland always is a very, very interesting example of a, of a periphery of the Enlightenment that also becomes a center in its, in its own right, with very particular configurations. It's highly urbanized, 
Um, so we have to keep our eye on the particular local manifestations um, when we're thinking about the broader movement of the Enlightenment. So that's an example of America um, being particular rather than exceptional. Um, yeah. So Americans are sort of unconstrained in one sense, but on the other hand, they have to do it themselves. It's kind of do-it-yourself type of enlightenment on the other. It's a kind of bottom-up rather than top-down sort of patronage-driven enlightenment. Um, it, it has to confront some unique problems, like the problem of slavery on, on a large scale uh, in the Americas. Um, I, I guess there's a Spanish American Enlightenment which may have to do the same, but I yeah. So don't know well, what to ask there. Well, no, I, that's a that's a great question, and this is this is one of the problems mm -hmm. that I want to wrestle with. That recently historians of Spanish America have put forth the idea that there was a Hispanic Enlightenment, which has its own particular mm -hmm. uh, questions. For example. Enlightened despotism. This is a term that is useful for the Spanish imperial context in the New World. Doesn't have a lot of purchase in North America because there's not really despotism, except when the American revolutionaries get all cranked up and believe that they see despotism uh, everywhere. So, what is one of the questions that I think we need to address are what are the connections between the Hispanic Enlightenment of Spanish America? and the American Enlightenment of North America, and how do we talk about the interplay of ideas between these... Is there a circulation of ideas within the Americas? So, um, not very much, mm -hmm. but it's there, and what is there is really, really interesting. Um, for example, the question of who the Aztecs were mm -hmm. and who they are is absolutely central to North Americans in the late 18th century. And so I have a chapter in my book about the invention of the idea of the Aztecs. The term Aztec is not coined until the late 18th century. There was a different terminology in play before that. The idea of the Aztecs helps North Americans who are expanding into the West to begin to tell themselves stories about who should rightfully live in the West, who lived there before, who is civilized, who is uncivilized, and for that they go deeply into the work of a number of Spanish American thinkers um, and actually begin to deposit in the American Philosophical Society um, some of the work that is being done by Spanish American scholars. Well, what, what particularly about the Aztecs interests them? So, <laughs> what, what interests them about the Aztecs is a couple things. One is that you know, they're, they're routinely told by Europeans, like Buffon, who's this French... Yeah, everything is inferior. Everything is inferior. Like the Indians, they say, mm -hmm. the Indians have no hair, they're, they're clearly a mark of the fact that everything degenerates mm -hmm. in the world. Animals are smaller, people are whatever. Um, and yet here are the Aztecs. The Aztecs have formed one of the mightiest cities in the world. You know, when Cortez shows up, this is an incredible city, and within the new framework of the idea of civilization that they developed during the 18th century, where do you fit the Aztecs into that? And a lot of European and American thinkers weigh in on this. So Voltaire famously comes up with the idea that, and he's joined by others in this, that the Aztecs actually are semi-civilized, right? So they're not like the French <laughs> who are civilized, but they're also not like what they call the savage wandering tribes of North America. So North American people like Jefferson look at this and say, wow, you know, there's this possibility that there was a people in the Americas that were semi-civilized. Um, we want to own that as we begin to make claims for American wonderfulness in the wake of the American Revolution. So how can we lay claim to the Aztecs? So they developed this incredible genealogy of the Aztecs that, that they essentially lived in California in a place called Aztlan um, a long time ago, and then they lived in the Midwest and formed the mounds. You know, if you go to the Midwest, you see the mound builders. And then they left 
And then as they moved south and settled in, in Mexico, they formed these big, beautiful cities. So this helps. So their early history was in this view, was in North America. Was in North America itself. when they were proto-civilized. Mm -hmm. The current Indians who live near the mounds have no memory of the mound builders. They don't know who built these things. And so people like Jefferson come in and say, well, we can ignore these modern Indians because they're, they're savages, they have no relationship to the civilized Aztecs who are gone anyway. Um, but we can still think that the Aztecs were really, really great um, and mow over the, the current inhabitants who live in the Midwest who are not in any way related so, to the you, Aztecs. Are, you're, you're kind of suggesting that as they became more and more aware of the achievements of Aztec civilization, sort of put a scare into their notions of the legitimacy of their own movement westward, and hence they had to make some kind of historical story out that distinguishes the two groups. Is that sort of the, yeah, what yeah. kind of happened? Yeah, they yeah. have to create, and you know, a lot of the Enlightenment is a, a historical sensibility. Mm -hmm. It's saying that I live in a distinctive era that is different and better from mm -hmm. the previous era. Mm -hmm. you know, now we no longer fight wars of religion. We're above that. We're beyond that. We don't fight about God. We fight about city-states and nation-states. This is what we do. And we have international orders like the Treaty of Westphalia that help us to govern states in a post-religious order. This is an Enlightenment narrative that operates very well in the European context. In the North American context, there is another Enlightenment narrative that is very similar, um, but that has to do with the deep history of the particular context of the Americas. What do we do with the Aztecs? How do we make sense of this people who came before and who are still there? <laughs> you know, they're still in Mexico City. How do we make sense of them so that we can build modern states? So the Mexican Revolution is very, very much about thinking through the meaning of the Aztecs. When William Prescott writes his histories of um, the Mexican Revolution in the 19th century, he's very much thinking about the Aztecs and their place in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, and it's an aspect of the American Enlightenment that no one has ever really talked about. Was, was, it, was that a, ma a matter of, of, of key concern or a kind of side thought? Oh no, it was a key concern. Mm -hmm. um, they were, um, the, the Mexican intellectuals who were writing about this were very, very well I'm thinking more of, of the British American. Yeah, no, the, yeah, the, the Mexican intellectuals who were writing were mm -hmm. very well known to the British Americans. They, um, they were eager to get these works translated and um, I think we've been reluctant to look at what's happening in Spanish America because we assume that everything about the North American Enlightenment must be about Britain or France. Of course, they're very, very important. They have a lot to do. But there are other really important intellectual trends that are going on as well um, that we simply need to look more carefully to find. So what does this say now? It's very interesting after the Second World War where people are trying to understand America's position and the role, its relationship to Europe, mm -hmm. uh, how it managed to miss uh, some of the horrors and nightmares of, of Europe. Um, that's 70 years ago. Uh, how does our understanding of this era in, America, in, in America's past uh, help us now make sense of our situation and our difficulties and potential and our choices? What would you say? Well, this is a question that I'm asking myself now and still finishing the research on. And I, I have begun what I call the Enlightenment Watch, which is that you know every time I open the New York Times, every time I go on the web, I'm on the lookout for modern Americans' usage of the idea of the Enlightenment and the uses of the term enlightened and enlightened. Enlightenment. And it's everywhere. Once you start looking, um, you see that the idea that there was an enlightenment and that we are becoming more enlightened and that if we're not, we should be, um, this is a really powerful idea for Americans. It's a, and it's often used in a polemical context. You know, we should be, we are not doing enough for this, we should be more enlightened. Um, we should be this, we should be that. And many, many different parts of the American political and religious spectrum lay claim to the Enlightenment. 
Um, so everyone wants to be this. Nobody said, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the team that everyone wants to join. No one wants to say, I am unenlightened. Um, so, so the question that you're asking is actually very, very complicated because if everyone is on the team, then what are we fighting about, right? So we're fighting about um, the different legacies of the 18th century in modern America, and I have not yet figured out. This would be probably true throughout the Anglosphere, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, almost anyone of, of, of political or cultural consequence would see themselves mm -hmm. uh, as heirs of the Enlightenment. They would. That's, that's probably a broader, uh, something you could say more broadly, just America right now. Uh, well, yeah, you know, we'd have to do the research on that. It may be that some people don't. Um, well, so if anybody mm -hmm. watches this and, and you're, you're reading the, right in, folks. <laughs> right in, right the, the British or Scottish <laughs> context, <laughs> let me know. I'm, I'm all ears. Is it, is it uh, again, maybe we're, we're, we're drifting a little uh, bit away from your field, uh, but could you say the same thing about continental Europe? Um, oh yeah, they, they... Does everyone want to be thought of as a, a descendant of the philosophs in continental Europe, yeah. or would you find some divisions? It's just swept the field throughout the West? Well, so that's what I don't know the answer to. The... No, no one has asked the question. No one has, has looked. What we know is that, especially in the field of European history, new books continue to be published on this topic all the time. It's a very live, very vibrant, wonderfully contentious field. Mm -hmm. um, the European Enlightenment, the idea has an oppositional quality to it. It's, it's a good forum for debate. Um, I'd like to see the same thing happen for the American Enlightenment as a field that we fight over rather than simply accepting. But what I think is that some of the variations in usage of people saying, you know, I am enlightened, you saying I am enlightened, is different perceptions of what the 18th century enlightenment was. For many Americans, it's very much about the founding moment. That it's, you know, the American enlightenment happened between the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Paine's Common Sense in 1776, and it kind of started to peter out after the Constitution of 1787, 1788. Um, or at least it played out afterwards. So if you look at the founding moment as the embodiment of the American Enlightenment, then you are saying a particular thing when you say, I am enlightened. If you take a broad church view of the American Enlightenment, that it's a series of intellectual attitudes that begin to appear between a lot earlier, 1650, 1660, and, and go all the way into the middle of the 19th century, then the genealogy of the Enlightenment becomes much richer and more complicated. And so some Americans are tapping into that broader Enlightenment. Um, for example, um, discussions of human rights in the modern world. Human rights is not something that they talk about in the Enlightenment. That's not a terminology that, that they have. But a lot of discussions of human rights today implicitly have a conception of connection to the Enlightenment. Well, they talk about natural rights. Isn't that pretty much the same as human rights? Um, it, it's it's similar, but it's not. There's not a hundred percent overlap. Certainly, natural rights was something that they worried about um, in the 18th century, but it's not the same as discourses of human rights in in the late 20th century and early 21st century. So it really depends on how broad or narrow mm -hmm. your definition of the 18th century enlightenment is. Well, the critical thing there is the difference between sort of negative rights, protection from mm -hmm. authoritarian coercion, and positive rights where you have entitlements to various things. Would, would you say that's the, the chief distinction between natural and human? You know, I, I, I have to be agnostic on this at this point because I haven't looked closely enough yet at the question. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is going to sort of be wrapping up the end of the book is why do we continue to be gripped by this question or not gripped by this question? You know, are Americans as interested in their own enlightenment as Europeans are in, in their enlightenment and how are these things very different? Um, again, no one has asked that question. Um, why the enlightenment in America and why now? Well, let's go down one more trail here. I mean, uh, people often say uh, that postmodernism is in important respects a repudiation mm -hmm. of the Enlightenment. And of course, postmodernism is not only a general cultural phenomenon, it's particularly 
part of the university scene. Um, they say that because postmodernism uh, is relativistic rather than kind of viewing things in the, in the absolute classically scientific way that the uh, 18th century savants would presumably have done it. Uh, rel relativistic, uh, again, these are the uh, characterizations of it in any event, uh, relativistic not only in terms of the possibilities of, of objectivity empirically, but also the possibilities of defining some kind of common moral ground mm -hmm. on which to build ethical uh, and political discourse. Um, uh, because it also seems, in, in many respects, to emphasize uh, intuition, notions of authenticity, sort mm -hmm. of uh, each person having a different perspective, particularly based on things like gender and race and class and stuff of that kind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more uh, particularistic uh, than universal. Um, if that's a reasonably accurate account of at least much that passes for postmodernism, uh, could it be said, again with the universities being a kind of vanguard of, of intellectual change, mm -hmm. uh, if that's what they are now, uh, couldn't it be said that perhaps we're, we're living in a post-enlightenment period or an early post-enlightenment period mm -hmm. rather than one where everybody celebrates the enlightenment? Right, a pre-post-enlightenment period. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, um, a lot of people have weighed in on this question. Uh, philosophers like Alistair McIntyre and John Gray have weighed in on whether we are you know, heirs of the Enlightenment or living in the era after Enlightenment and, and, and what does that mean when you live in an era beyond you know, some of the grounding um, presumptions that the Enlightenment gave us. There was a moment at the height of the linguistic turn in postmodernism in the 1980s and 1990s when there was a lot of concern for whether anything was left of the Enlightenment in the wake of the critiques of postmodernism that you have put before us. You know, if language is just a symbol of signs and there's no fixed meaning, then how can there be Enlightenment, et cetera, et cetera. What's interesting is that those conversations did not occur vis-a-vis -vis the American Enlightenment. It was very much a, a European-centered phenomenon. Um, the American Enlightenment essentially um, remained intact. No one asked the question about whether it applied to the American Enlightenment, and I believe that it's because of this foundational quality of the American Enlightenment that um, there there was no question in people's minds that you know the the Declaration of Independence meant what it meant, and 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 if it didn't mean what it meant, then why was there a United States afterward? And so whatever damage or invigoration occurred within Enlightenment studies after the postmodern challenge, nothing really seemed well, I mean, to happen. But it, but it certainly could be said that we now have, with respect to that other great Enlightenment document, the U.S. Constitution, that we have a, a constructivist approach to it, mm -hmm. um, that it is constantly evolving and, mm -hmm. and being rebuilt in terms of modern there's a, there's a, the, the dominant, well, this, I, I, I probably fair to say the dominant school of jurisprudence in our law schools uh, is, is something like that. Uh, not necessarily epistemologically radical, but certainly moved away from, from the notion that it, it is what it says. And that's, right, that's but no one, ever, no one ever thought that it is what it said. Even in the 1790s, people were beginning to explore the possibility. That, that there was no fixed meaning, that it was a document that had um, room for ambiguity. Um, it didn't well, cover a, a, all bases. A number within which you could argue is not quite the same thing as no fixed meaning. Yeah, yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, but I would say that, um, yeah, it, it, these kinds of questions are the very mm -hmm. ones that continue to make people find excitement and invigoration with, within the Enlightenment um, in a way that we don't necessarily do for other eras um, in American history, mm -hmm. kind of as a, as a totality. You know, we, some eras, of course, have a lot of purchase on the American psyche, you know, the, the legacy of the Puritans. But, but I think that those tend to go in the direction in the common mind of, of kind of caricature, you know, you're puritanical or, or whatever. But the Enlightenment, 
tends to be a more complicated conversation um, than a lot of other ones that we have about our national past. What does it mean to think of ourselves as a people who is enlightened and that wants to become more enlightened? Um, that's a really complicated question. And I think that we can make it more complicated and more interesting and more fruitful. So this timeliness is part of what, what made you want to deal with the subject and, and, and write the book. Yeah, yeah. And, and I also just thought that a lot of the wonderful work that had been done earlier was in need of updating, that mm -hmm. there had been so much terrific work in European Enlightenment studies, in the history of science, and all of this needed to kind of come together um, into a more comprehensive understanding of a thing that happened in the past, but that also has a lot of modern resonance today, in the same way that I did in my first book, The Culture of Classicism. You know, here was a tradition that that came and went, but we mourn its passing. And what does it mean that we mourn its passing? So I, I like to think about ideas that um, that rose and that fell, but that continue to haunt us today for various reasons. Because some areas of history, you know, they happen and we, we don't care. You know, they're, they're gone and, and that's the end. But some continue, like the Civil War, um, to have a lot of um, pressure on the national psyche, and, and the Enlightenment is one of those. Well, thank you for this enlightening discussion, and for the book that will enlighten further. Uh, it's, it, it will be appearing uh, about when, you think? Um, hopefully, uh, in a, about two years from Yale University Press. Okay. Well, good luck with that, and thank you, thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you for having me.